Hello and welcome to my clip on the on our second session in the ad hoc design studio New Materialist Articulations. I would like to start <laughs> with the background image which I chose. It is from um, René Descartes. It is a picture in relation to what he called the world. And part of the reasons why I chose it as a motto for, um, for a background uh, to this talk is that I am very, very interested in the meteora, uh, in the weather, if you want, in, in, uh, in this ob objective phenomena, we could say, that uh, we all live with and in, <laughs> and that in a way form a natural milieu or also a natural condition for the earth, for the planet and for all materiality in that sense. There would be an interesting story on René Descartes and his specific relation to the Meteora, but that would be for another talk. What I would like to do today is give you a little bit of a context of my own uh, interest and approach to new materialism, <coughs> which of course follows um, in many ways the same genealogies that you've heard uh, from Iris and from also from Nana's um, uh, lectures for today's se session. But I also uh, have a specific interest in um, the philosophy of Michel Serre. And this is because in his approach, in his new materialist approach, there is a great attention to what he calls uh, the incandescent. So, <clears throat> Materiality today is very much related to light, the physics of light, to quantum physics. We have talked about that quite a lot in our first session. And what he begins to make a very strong concept with uh, this idea of uh, something incandescent is um, something like um, the condition, yeah, I don't know, something out of which, <laughs> so incandescent literally means something which could potentially catch fire. Yeah? So it's not properly light, it's something like pre-specific light, or yeah, something like that. And what is so intriguing about this topic is that if we would simply say, well, it's something like the potential for light, or we would say it is something like light's actuality, which can be actualized, or whether we would say it's something like a specific notion of virtuality that relates to light, we are always already catapulted <laughs> into entire um, philosophical worldviews, we could perhaps say, or paradigms, which he tries um, not to fall into. <laughs> yeah? And the reason for it is that there is a figure which shows beautifully on these different covers of, the, uh, different, of some of the different editions of his book. The first edition when I bought the book was this one, and I was always puzzled about this line. Yeah. About this line. What, what is it? What does it... So there's something of a scar, of course. There is something of a cultivated earth. There is um, then on another version also the bed of a river. Yeah. And again, the cultivation of... the agricultural cultivation of land. And in the um, most recent English translation of the book, we lose all of that, and we watch at something like an abstract sky. <laughs> all of these pictures speak a lot about the difficulty of these concepts. And if for nothing else, <laughs> this is, um, of course, always one of the most intriguing things, to think about the things which we cannot yet think. So that is a, a part of the background um, of this interest, but now let's uh, uh, see just briefly and a little bit of what it promises, why it is so interesting. So this here is his book, The Incandescent, this is in the translation by Randolph Burks, so it's the, the sky picture, <laughs> the English translation, and <clears throat> if you look at its table of contents, what we see is that it tries to think through this notion of the 
incandescent, a relation between forgetfulness and memory. So a relation between storytelling that involves an, act, an activity of forgetting. And this is what gives storytelling something very natural, <laughs> yeah, something, a quality of nature in the sense that something natural can be born and can die. Yeah? So, so there is um, a very material and also a quick, so an alive uh, um, association, scope of association, we could say, that uh, uh, comes to go together with, um, with memory, with narrative, with history, with culture, with practices, with techniques, and so on. And what it also does is, it introduces again, or it makes strong again, a notion of the universal that would not be in contradiction to such an understanding of grand narrative. Grand Russie is the uh, French term. I don't think a grand narrative uh, captures very well <clears throat> what le grand Russie means because the Russie comes from recevoir. So there is something about receiving and reception. So the active part of this kind of narrative uh, falls just as much to the act of the reception as to the act of the telling or the talking. And we read today, uh, for today, an article on um, new materialism through the, the lens of uh, uh, some new kind of literacy, which we called uh, quantum literacy. And one of the aspects of quantum literacy entails that um, we speak physically. <laughs> yeah. So with, with, um, with our technologies today, with electricity, with uh, the digital logistics, with the digital production, um, production technologies and so on, words really do matter, not primarily in a metaphorical sense now, but um, an object like this one comes to be an articulation. Yeah. Nana's talk was very uh, inspiring precisely with regards to this, I think. And <clears throat> there is a, a kind of, a, um, or what, what the, the concept of the incandescent is looking for, in my understanding, is, is, a, is, is a, a scope a scope of thought or of projectivity, perhaps, where these two gestures of encountering and crossing could coexist, could even be codependent upon one upon the other. And such a scope, uh, Michel Serre, uh, relates to it again, the notion of the universal, which is a very provocative thing to do today. Now, how can the universal not be, how can it be at ease with difference? That is the key question which, um, of course, inspires all endeavors in new materialism. So in Serre's version, they can. <laughs> we cannot really go into, <clears throat> into a detailed uh, discussion now, but I would like to show you how, um, how his book starts. Yeah, so his book, we could say, what, what would be, a, what, how, I mean, if you think about the gesture, there is a philosopher, he wants to write a book entitled L'Incandescent, so The Incandescent. It's a kind of a, a figuration, a person, an impersonation of this uh, uh, very ungraspable, very, very, uh, very difficult notion. So how would one start such a book? <laughs> yeah, because it cannot objectively be seen. The incandescent. There is not really many stories that one could just like that make reference to. So how does he start? He begins by writing. He gives us a scenery. At the end of the lane, <clears throat> rising through the forest, positioned on a tall grassy hillock, surrounded by a torrent descending from the mountain, a farm and its annexes overlook a cirque, dominated by glaciers. Beneath the morning sun and the motionless air, this view, this landscape, this scene revealed to me in an ecstatic epiphany, a quiet presence of the things in their exact place. Transparent and white, space here seems to swallow up time suspended. He gives us a situation. He gives us a scenery <laughs> within which we, we can project ourselves. Yeah? What would, so he doesn't explain what an ecstatic epiphany is. And that is much of the 
of the story's um, of the story's interest, of course, because if he would explain what ecstatic epiphany is. If he would just explain to us what an ecstatic epiphany is, he would inevitably objectify it. He would surrender it, subject it to an analytical point of view. He would be constructing an experience of it through some synthetical articulation. This is not what he intends to do. Rather, he wants to give a kind of a landscape access, like landscapes can open us up <laughs> to experiences. Yeah? So experiences which are much like this kind of weather here. So we can, many of us can walk through the same landscapes, but we, may, we will make quite different experiences. Something like this he is trying to do as well. And what he uh, discusses now is, he starts out from this, um, from this farm, where there is a father and a child, and he begins to make experienceable different temporalities that belong to all the objects or all the uh, factors, we could say, or all the things in this landscape, the times which they incorporate. So space that seems to swallow up time and suspends time in an embodiment of it. This is what he wants to expose and talk about. It involves the human scale, it goes to the scale of generations, but it also goes to the material scales of the river, the glacier, the seas, the winds, the weather, that uh, um, all participate or play together like many different scales at the same time, creating this one situation of which he says, and he can do no more than suggest that it's possible, <laughs> it can be the site of an, ecstat of an ecstatic epiphany. And ecstatic is uh, uh, interesting, of course, because it literally means where we are not quite ourselves. So in an ecstatic experience, it has something to do with um, stepping out of one's body. And the interesting thing, and that's part of what relates to the incandescent, is that this step is not there in order to get rid of the body, but to make room for bodies. It is, of course, not an easy um, uh, adventure of thinking, we could say. So I will not try to make this all too short and trivial, inevitably trivial, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a narrative about it. But you can, if you follow the, um, the titles, you can perhaps get a kind of a, an idea, an Vorstellung. So he's beginning to speak of balconies of space-time. Yeah? So not one continuity of space-time, not a four-dimensional great continuity, but also not strata, which would be geological and, and absolute each, but balconies of space-time that articulate this scenery uh, into which he introduces us. Then, from such balconies, one can observe the happening <laughs> outside of the house, no? Before the background of, of a certain kind of an assurance, a balcony is usually attached to a house. So one is not quite at home and one is also not quite public. And from such a point of view, he begins to study how the different temporalities of different things play together. Here we have the rose and the gardener. This is a site or an, a, a situation which might in many ways, of course, be comparable to um, to, 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 to machine making in the philosophy of Deleuze and Gattari, you know, of, of, uh, of the orchid and the wasp and so on. But it never fuses, it never unifies, it never unifies the things into one dynamics. It's not a making of this relation. It is a kind of a, of an, a, a, a thinking oneself in both of the different scalarities that play together. He does the same with the Grand Canyon and the torrent. He will go to the glacier. Um, and then there's a kind of a turning point because he says, so we can, we can think in this, but then we can also access a certain kind of forgetting that they embody. So time is at one and the same, <laughs> in one and the same situation, it is embodied. So it is swallowed up. Time is suspended in space, but in such a way that one must assume a superabundance, a superabundance of time. So in my last talk, I 
spoke a little bit about atomic time and, and, and atom time. And um, this is some of the background where these uh, ideas are coming from. If we go to the level of, uh, of the DNA, of course, of the, uh, of the species, of, 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 the, of the classification of animate beings, I don't call it ontologies, deliberately so, but the kind of uh, uh, the classification, the description of differences and of uh, generalities and so on. It is a book I very much um, uh, recommend to read, and it is um, it is one of the let's say access gates or points um, uh, for my specific interest in new materialism. We heard. And we know, with respect to uh, this very strong and beautiful approach by Karen Barat in meeting the universe halfway, now her insistence that every single point embodies all of it. So in every point there is the atom bond, there, there is the atomic bond. In every point that we create as an abstraction to think something, this very point contains the histories of all the peoples. For her it is the histories of the, uh, uh, of the, of the different um, of the different uh, indigenous, uh, uh, so every point can be the property of all any of the indigenous um, um, owners of these properties um, in past time. So we we are through this already a little bit familiar with this uh, re-featuring, let's say, or reappearance of an interest in the universal in the tradition in which there are things. It would not be so much about one point embodying all of this, but it would be about a kind of a frame, perhaps, where one can assume that things are all one and whole, but they are contractible in an infinite amount of different manners. So there is an affirmation of a notion of a unity that goes together with an affirmation of the reality um, of multiplicity, of differences. But there is a kind of a screen or a, a surface film, one could say, you know, the site of such an epiphany. And this surface screen, um, this is what Serre refers to as the site of contracts. And this now becomes a very strong notion because it makes these ideas of a gnorosy and of uh, a combination or an active thinking of not only memory but also forgetting when we think about time very very uh, political um, because of course it informs ideas of contracts and with contracts ideas of social order of natural order of political order and what is important to understand um, with respect to the new materialism is that in such a thinking this setup no, where everything would be one but it can be contractible in many ways is not simply a combinatorics of abstract points and entities or properties if you want but it becomes a pact a pact yeah so there is something inconceivable something inexplainable that makes a contract work in this understanding which also requires um, a certain kind of, of faith. And that is um, unusual in our times <laughs> to refer to or to speak about, but I would just like to recall very briefly you know, two of the perhaps most influential um, treatises on, a, on uh, introducing actually the notion of a social contract. Um, one is by, by Hobbes, Levi Leviathan, so it was the idea that basically men are all at war with each other as a kind of a natural state to depart from when inventing what could be a good uh, order of commonwealth, as he called it. And what you see is that um, there as well we had a materialism, no? the matter, form and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil, that's how he called it. We will see ecclesiastical, this already accommodates a spiritual order, so ecclesiastical usually means being a member of an order or being a member of a priesthood or something like that. This would just be reconciled with a civil, with a civil condition. It was uh, yeah, one, of the, one of the starting points for contract theory in politics. When we look a little bit later at another articulation of it by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 
who wrote a book which was called Du Contrat Social, Au Principe du Trois Politique. So here, this natural state, which for Hobbes was a kind of a given, no? an extrapolated generalization perhaps of, of something very uh, profound or very, um, very ordinary, <coughs> that every man is at war, <laughs> naturally at war with every other man. Um, Rousseau, Rousseau wanted to think about principles, so not a natural state, but principles of political right. And these principles he would then later call also a kind of a natural contract. So his social contract was conceived to be a kind of a natural contract because it assumed um, that there is something like a general will. I have here just a table of contents of these works. So this one is the, is the one by, by Rousseau. You see what is at stake is um, societies, struggles, hierarchies, then the notion of a state, political state, the notion of sovereignty, the alienableness, no? Can, is it thinkable that there could be a notion of sovereignty? How does it behave with differentiating or with, uh, yeah, identity and alienation? Different forms. What Rousseau maintained is that there is naturally a general will and so where we have this, uh, this struggle or this, uh, this, this kind of civic war situation in Hobbes, with Rousseau we have the assumption of a kind of a general will. This one is um, the, the table of contents of Hobbes. It is also perhaps insightful to look at what it treats, no? because um, it's quite, yeah, it could be quite surprising that what is at stake is imagination, it is speech, it is reason, it is science, it is the passions, it is you not know, the ends or resolutions of a discourse, so it is the achievement of consensus, it is virtues, mm, it is the diversity of different subjects of knowledge, it is uh, the relations of power, worthiness, dignity, honor, and so on, manners, miracles, the use of miracles, the relation to the holy scriptures. So you see, it really is. So when we say today in new materialist teaching that everything is contained or crystallizes in every single point that we identify, they used to think precisely like it. <laughs> yeah. So this, I think, is important to recall. And it is the basis for Michel Serre's book. So he makes another step and begins to speak now not of natural law and a new social contract like Rousseau, but he begins to speak of a natural contract. And this natural contract means now, here we have the, the motto of it, <clears throat> it's a painting where two men are at, at war, if you want, they're, they're fighting, but they're fighting on a ground which is not solid, they're fighting on a ground of quicksand, and the painting uh, entails a whole audience which watches the two people in combat, and fight against, like in a game, or who is going to win, who is going to be the strongest. So nobody realizes that things are sinking into the ground. <laughs> and Michel Serre made this a very topical image to refer to the situation of a, of a natural, of the necessity of a natural contract, because the social contracts all make their pact, so the constitutive pact for the contract notion that they propose, as adversary to nature, yeah? So the solidarity among men must depend upon having a common enemy or a common, yeah, nature. <laughs> and what Ser begins to say is, we need to make contracts with nature. So he implies that there is, so nature speaks in his understanding. It is why many people relate his thinking, uh, some appreciatively and some not at all appreciatively, as a kind of a metaphysics or even a mysticism. But it treats again of everything, like the big social um, contract theories. So it, it attends war and peace, natural contract, the role of science and law. And then, very important, this last moment of a contract making it possible to cast off. 
Yeah? And casting off, this is something you can think in relation to these balconies of time and space. Yeah, to a kind of a scalarity that doesn't mean one needs to destroy the place where one comes from in order to find new grounds or one needs to appropriate a certain house or a certain territory in order to have a place for one's own rule. It is a casting off and an, and, and an, and an increasing building <laughs> out, we could say perhaps more than building up, a building out of scalarities where Space is never scarce. So this is um, this is a promise of of, a, of of this approach. And what I would like to show you is how imaginations like this, you know, there we could say they are they are yeah, scopes of projections or they are um, yeah not properly world pictures because they don't there is not much concreteness in it they're more on the level of the of the paradigm so how to construct paradigms um, that's perhaps what we could say now <clears throat> i want to to speak briefly about why why i think this notion of the pact is so important because if we just have contracts no so there is a very trivial understanding of contracts, which is in fact implemented in all our logistic uh, devices. So when I try to call you on my phone, my phone, in, without me noticing it, negotiates contracts with all the companies offering um, uh, telephone lines. Um, and also the quality of the line that I will get, it depends on how much I pay for my for my. Uh, no, my monthly fees. <laughs> so all of these are contracts. So information technology is organized in terms of contracts. So contracts reduces um, the authority, let's say, of regulations or of arrangements to a play of rules among rules that follow protocols. And <clears throat> this, um, this existential or this cosmic outside that um, always go together with the philosophical notions of contract theories is so important because if we try to let it go, if we say that we, we make contracts which involve no pacts, no, rather than involving a certain kind of a, of a, of, of a commitment to, to, a, to a shared whatever it may be, we just pay our dues, no, our fees. Um, there is a predominance of a notion which one usually calls vanity, vanitas. It has something to do in German, the, the, the proper term for it is uh, nichtigkeit. And nichtigkeit, it's not quite nothing, but it's also not quite nihilism or annihilation. It is, in a way, a kind of an empty being, no? a being which has no worth, which embodies no worth. And it has been a topic in, in, uh, in, in philosophy and in the arts again and again, very specifically and very interestingly, for example, in Baroque times. So there was a, a, a whole genre of painting which was called Vanitas Still Lives. And what it began to do is, you know, when in a still life, we have objects, we could say, that also embody different durations or different uh, temporalities in the sense that we have a fresh looking strawberry next to a rotten apple at, on, the, on, the, on one and the same table, for example. Yeah, so there is a celebration of, uh, of an incongruency, we could say, um, between the quickness or the liveliness, the temporalities of objects in a still life. And what Vanita still lives begin to do is to symbolize this. And to symbolize means to, to, to in a way, totalize it. So Vanita's still lives, they would start to present symbols of death and of ephemerality um, it, it's a, it's a kind it's like a, every vanita still life becomes a generalization <laughs> of still lives we could perhaps say and <clears throat> here is a famous one by peter Bull, which he called allegorie der nichtig der nichtigkeiten der welt no? so an allegory of the vanities of the world. It is from the 17th century. And you see, these are all symbolical objects. So they're, they're objects incorporating symbolical power. And that is precisely what uh, results from a notion of contract, 
which doesn't have a subject status anymore. So, 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 so this is this is at, at the at the core of uh, of the topic of the of the vanity and the vanitas and why I, I bring it in in relation to this uh, contract theory and to the idea of the natural contract, because if we forget that there is an element of the of a pact involved, but we get these technical symbolizations, technical symbolizations, each of which is a kind of a totality, <laughs> yeah, and becomes. Um, almost the opposite of the vulnerability that is cultivated in still lives. It becomes a kind of a parade of uh, a superpower <laughs> yeah, in things. And I got very interested in this, partly because, um, that's not the one I wanted yet, partly because of one particular branch that is often associated with or against new materialism, which is object-oriented ontology. So here one book, um, one of the perhaps most influential books by Graham Harmon, um, with, the, with the, the important subtitle, A New Theory of Everything. Yeah. So <clears throat> basically what Harmon here says is that science wanted to not claim its authority by saying we are developing a theory of everything. So, so any, to anybody it will become accessible to understand the world in one and the same way. This is what uh, he reduces <laughs> uh, science to have claimed. And now he says, but this time is gone. Now to create a theory of everything is up to the arts. The arts make facts. <laughs> the arts make facts. And the organization of these facts, this is the job of philosophy. And it produces what he calls an object-oriented ontology. This has a lot, no, there is, there is nowhere a moment of pact involved here. There is, quite differently, um, instead of a pact, a new kind or another kind, a special kind of a contract, namely the contract of a journalist. Of a journalist um, that observes and organizes the happenings um, very much like on the image uh, that Michel Serre put with the two men fighting on a quicksand. So it's a kind of a framing of the action and uh, 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 an interested and a super full of fantasy and, 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 and really fantastic writing, uh, vividness, liveliness, entertainment about all the serious things that happen in the world. <laughs> so it's a kind of a, it has, yeah, has a lot to do with this in its gesture, which, uh, which is very interesting. Graham Harmon, indeed, started out as a sports journalist. And when I read his texts, I can never really get rid of this uh, sense uh, of, of, of being, being presented the article of a, uh, of a sports journalist while I observe a game. So I'm being explained what is happening. And I'm mentioning this because there is, um, at least I have only very recently heard about him, a German, um, a German a sports journalist who is also a philosopher, Wolfram Eilenberger, and he has, a, he has a, a, a column at Die Zeit where he writes about sports and he does something very, um, very interesting. So he begins to address the rules of the game of such compositions. Yeah? So yeah, he begins to address the rules of the game by saying in sports, there is always chance which plays a role. And <clears throat> if we accept that chance plays a role, the current form of reporting on a soccer game, for example, which always starts out from the end result, three towards zero, <laughs> yeah, one side has one, uh, it can completely miss what is actually going on in a game. The action uh, that is going on in a game more often than not, is not directly represented in the end result. So the, 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 the situation that he, that he picks up here is the very surprising statement of a trainer, of a, of a hugely renowned trainer, um, who said after his team lost, well, the result was zero to three, 
we lost, but everything else was super. <laughs> and this is not a cynical statement. This is, that is the argument that he, uh, Jürgen Klopp develops here. This is um, simply the counting in of, uh, in German here he says Schicksal, yeah? so, some kind of destiny, some kind of chance. So I would say this is an, an approach to game, <laughs> to game, uh, game theory if we want, that cultivates both a kind of a packed situation, but also an analytical rigor. And <clears throat> why I'm saying this is because part of, part of this great, I would call it a legacy that is introduced with, um, especially with Rosie Blaidotti into new materialism, I would say dwells in something very similar. So this is, this is the book, uh, Iris also mentioned it, one of the first books by her, where we have as a core argument images of the void. Yeah? So this situation of the vanitas motif, of the nichtigkeit, what she sets out in order to develop a, a theme, patterns of dissonance, is images of the void. So, images of the void, and if I understand correctly, what she ever since pushes as imaginaries, affirmative imaginaries, we need to build imaginaries of our world, has a lot to do with, if we want relating such a notion of pact, with images of the void. So she has, she begins with a very famous citation by Michel Foucault, who says in a text um, which, 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 which picks up, which recites, we could say, um, a text by Immanuel Kant on the question, what is enlightenment? And he says, Michel Foucault says, that Anthropos is no longer here. No? The, 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 the trace of man has been washed away by the sea at the beach. It's no longer there, there's an absence of it, and the absence of the trace of anthropos in general, or a natural notion of an anthropos, of man. This is the kind of void which, has, which, which incorporates the room for the storytelling um, that new materialism is very much engaged with. And the important point, again, it comes with this notion of the pact in relation to a contract, is that the crisis, the states of crisis that we have, they are not just material in a sense of um, uh, uh, injustices and, and, and scarcities and, and uh, yeah, things like this, but they are also intellectual. There's an intellectual state of uh, a crisis, a state of intellectual crisis, um, which <clears throat> we need to invent new imaginaries. Um, to contract them. Not yet this, but let's look quickly at the table of content of Rosi Braidotti's book. So it begins with the images of the void. In order to diagnose, to become able to diagnose a crisis. This is interesting because here we have diagnostics preceding a critique. And this interplay, diagnostics preceding critique, in my understanding, has a lot to do with Michel Serre's scales or his balconies of space-time, which somehow all participate and belong to one and the same situation, but playing a part in a 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 grandness. In a, in not, it's not really a grandness. It's not. It doesn't need to be equipped with moral values, but the bigness of history. Yeah. A grand, uh, a, a grand Russie. <clears throat> so they all coexist. They are all partly one, but contracted in many, many, many different ways. Um, I'm not well familiar yet with Braidotti's book here, but I'm super intrigued because she begins to introduce again the notion of the cogito no? and the Cartesian. So she, in a way, goes behind Kant uh, uh, and reattends again to rationalism in relation to a new materialism and this um, holds great uh, potential I would say to continue doing that. One person who does this 
is uh, Massimo Cacciari. He's an Italian philosopher and politician. He was for a long time the mayor of, uh, of Venice. And he wrote a book which again relates to this notion of the centrality of a pact with the title The Withholding Power. His point is that we cannot theorize political forms entirely independent of um, uh, religious and spiritual questions. Yeah? So to reintroduce um, a relation between theology and politics through what he calls here a withholding power. So not just countable potentials that can be transformative with respect to each other, <laughs> no, without, without points into a beyond, but um, a withholding power, one which is not entirely rationalized and perhaps not entirely rationalizable either. And why or how this becomes um, a very powerful notion is uh, through what he calls no, a, so a radical critique of political reason. So the assumption of such a withholding power now doesn't mean that we need to go and try to analyze the withholding power. Precisely not. No, it is like the presence of chance um, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the battle that Michel Serre depicts or that uh, Eilenberger talks about with respect to an appreciation of the complexity of sports. Just the assumption that it's there will change how we can analyze things which are happening and how we can describe it. And this is what uh, Kachari suggests as well. He says, in order to be able to do a radical critique of political reason, we need to assume the unpolitical. Yeah? So we need to, <laughs> the withholding power allows now to say, we create dualities of everything which is, I don't know, powerful, important, bothering, annoying, violent. So all the, all the, the big words, we just need to assume they're negatives, but now not in a figurative way. No? So political and unpolitical. So entropy and negentropy. A negation of it which does not involve a characterization of either one of the two. And from such an interplay then, it becomes possible to perform what he calls a radical critique. And this is philosophically an extremely interesting relation because what would be the grounds for such a critique? No, what would be the grounds for a critique that somehow intervenes or articulates the whole spectrum of political to unpolitical? No? So if we treat dualities like this, we get something like the color spectrum. So all the colors are between white and black. No? And white <laughs> is the totality of all the colors, just like black is the totality of all the colors. So the two points become I would say, no, inverse to each other, but being the same. So, so perhaps the reference of a contract. I'm not sure how to how to be, uh, uh, yeah, how to be adequately precise now on this level. But there is a kind of an instrumentality now introduced, which needs to support. Which no, the, the reason of a radical critique comes to be the reason that is no longer territorial or original or no, rooted in a certain tribe, in a certain arche, a certain uh, uh, beginning, but rather it, it is an embodiment of, uh, of, of, a, of a relation that is kept in suspension, something like this. And this gesture now, I, I would, uh, I'm very interested in generalizing this. Perhaps it's not generalizing it, perhaps it's just, just articulating it. Yeah. So, a notion of a radical critique cannot be territorial. It has something to do with the meteora. Yeah? <laughs> it has something to do with living in the weather. And perhaps we could say it is a kind of a terroir. No? The reason of radical critique forms as a kind of a terroir, or these balconies, like Serre is describing them. But if we look at them from, through the lens of a, of a rationalism, we can perhaps begin to speak of a digital continent. And the digital continent, no, a continent is not a territory. I mean, of course, it is also territorial, but it is not a territory in the sense that it means uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a containing. So it's not properly a frame. It is, um, yeah, a container. <laughs> so it is a, a, a metaphysical figure, I would say. 
And what would it mean to think of the digital as forming the material substrate, the material grounds of such a continent? Yeah, it would be a continent where territory is never scarce, <laughs> where territory also is not more or less original. All of these things. But this is very abstract, and it is so also for me still. But there is a way to imagine better how we could go or think about this. And in, quite sur for me, it was very surprising to find this actually in um, Alberti, the Renaissance architect, um, who became very famous with this kind of um, coding in painting. Yeah. So what you have here is a is a is a film with a rational grid. And then the points are placed such as to, to, to establish an analogy, perhaps, between, or an, uh, yeah, actually, this is, uh, analogy is the wrong term here, it really is a representation of an object in a painting of 3D and 2D. Yeah. So the points, and that is the, uh, the link I want to make to the digital continents, the points here, if we address what they do, so not just from the the starting and the end point, the painting and the and the and the and the and, and, the, and the, uh, the the woman in this case, but what they do performatively these points, they are uh, coding, they are establishing a contractuality, <laughs> they are establishing the index points of a contractuality, such that points can be communicated, and they can be communicated across different medias, different, um, mm, different um, ways of presenting, let's say. When thinking about this, so there is a lot of, um, there has been a lot written about Alberti, always in a kind of an epistemological critique, saying that he suggests a total, so an identicality between um, between a painting or a representation and its original, no, and the kind of a, a copying, a machinic, a mechanical copying, which um, which trivializes uh, the ingenuity of the artist if it is brought, um, if we, if we, uh, yeah, if we think it through. So that is how Alberti is usually uh, criticized and received. But what? He, one can also see in him, I mean, there is no necessity to see it like that, obviously, but it is not at all unlikely to read his gestures from the point of view of how we encounter digitization and coding in new materialism today as a similar gesture um, in a different time. Yeah? And we can say that um, Alberti was interested in a kind of a physics of seeing. And the physics of seeing now, this is interesting because it, a physics in this sense is not, not either anatomy or optics, no? either the subjective, um, uh, the subjective point of view of how the eye works and how um, uh, phenomena appear uh, uh, in sight and so on, or uh, the diopter and the optical instruments. It has to do with um, the mathematics, of any optical instrument on the one hand, but then also with a, really a notion of the nature of seeing. And when we look at, um, at his uh, treatise on painting, which was one of the first treatises on painting that did not focus on, on the plot, on the themes, on the stories, but that was interested in identifying elements, Elementa Pittura was the title of this book, uh, and then how he goes about it. It's a kind of a, a physics of seeing, and the physics manifests in the surface, in the surface of things. No? And, and the surface, and for, for, um, for, for indexing or for coding the surface of things, he had a whole vocabulary, which is architectonic. <clears throat> so this is why he would say uh, later at one point that architecture is painting in three dimensions. Um, and the background to this is that painting doesn't try to reproduce nature, <laughs> rather it finds images in nature. So painting has little to do with inventio, with erfindung, 
but with inventum of images that can be found in nature. And here we have something similar again, like in there with these balconies. Yeah? So not nature is a picture, no? or we can imagine nature at large, but nature is, uh, 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 is where we can find pictures, uh, motifs for pictures, which we need to figure out. And how Alberti was thinking of nature had very much to do with this. So to find what he calls, it, what in, in the German translation is called Naturbilder, is something which only becomes visible, which only appears once nature has been coded in a certain way. So this argument in Alberti was very much related to a kind of a nature of art, no? to say the there is a nature of art, but this nature of art, it is not a nature that would have an original state that could be corrupted. Rather, it is a nature that emerges out of civic life. Yeah. And he said, so if art then is not a principle where one very special person is being talented, is being gifted with a genius or with a certain yeah, talents and, and, uh, and dispositions, let's say, if we want to really have a generally valid approach to art, then art must be a kind of a nature. But this nature now, he says, it results, so he says literally, mm, the idea is not completely unlikely that opportunity, chance and attention are the engenderers of the arts, while exercise and experiments were the nourishers of arts, and while the arts were growing up through insight and reasonable thought. <laughs> I find this an extremely beautiful understanding of art because it does no longer make a difference between science versus art um, or even different, you know, different uh, yeah, specializations in art. It's really a kind of a nature, but it's a nature which has never been given as a resource. It's a nature which does not come in finite, in finite um, uh, yeah, bodies, but it's a nature which is being engendered, just like um, evolution thinks of uh, of no of, of the of the planet and it's and it and, and the milieus for different life forms that are uh, coming about. And with this, I don't want to say that now we can have an evolution of the arts. No, <clears throat> um, that's not that's not um, that's not the point. The point is uh, that we can find an outside or we can, we can invent a form of rationalization which doesn't need to have scarcity, no? a resource, a finite resource, resource as its, um, its counter-image. And this is important because we are living in a time, of course, where recycling is um, one of the most interesting topics, one of the most urgent topics as well. But the troubling thing is that we cannot think an entirely rational approach to recycling because the ration, precisely because the rationalization presupposes that there is, um, a, um, yeah, that there is the production of a, a pollution in that sense. So the production of things which, which hinder the cycles from circling, yeah, which, 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 um, which kind of intervene in a natural distribution in a natural uh, balance. And <clears throat> this is usually then called the consumption. It's a bit like with vanity, no? It's a, the production or the, 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 the taking room of um, void things, no? of, of uh, um, things of no worth, of no worth anymore. So it's in the topic of consumption as well. And this now begins to change when we think us, when we project us into this world of a physics, of seeing and a nature of the arts. There are three concepts which, to which we are relating now very, very differently to how it was done at the time of Alberti. Mm, they all relate with one another. So, Perhaps the most important one is that this kind of um, you know, rationalized 
depiction, we could say. It was also called copying. It was also related to a copy and that, uh, through that to um, a multiplication. But the notion of the, of, the co of the copy meant something very different than it does today. So it's not an instance of a mass-produced great number of one and the same things, but rather copia in Latin means um, an abundance. So precisely not a scarcity. Yeah? So Alberti would also say, he would say, no, um, painting is much larger than art is. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the copiousness, so not every painting is art, um, but painting is always copying in his understanding. And, the, and it's related to an abundance, so, one, uh, so a, a kind of a, no, it, it's too, so it's like a, a complex situation which we can rationalize in many, many ways. Not only we can, but we need to. So that's the point with complexity. We need to picture what is going on. And these pictures then, they trigger, they have consequences because they give us the dispositions for further steps. So this is how we, he was thinking about painting. Copia, an abundance. To copy meant, yes, to duplicate, not to double, to make a double, but not in order to say, well, the double is now so precisely controlled in its making that it, it, that it, is, that it just can step in for the original. It's not a doubling which wants to get rid, to overtake the original. Um, it's a doubling which, uh, which uh, that would be my interest to argue, is actually, is actually about keeping um, this nature, or this, this, this I, I would call this an invariance, keeping it alive. No, not killing it, but it promises a way of an analytical perspective, of an analytical thought with all its rigor that does not need to kill the thing which it analyzes, but rather keeps it alive. <laughs> so, copiare literally also meant to transcribe, to write in plenty, and if you think, for example, this um, notion, so to transcribe in relation to translation. No? If we say there must be transcription, so this kind of uh, a code, a encoding in lexical points, but also the whole instrumentality which makes it possible to proceed like it, is part of transcribing, we can begin to speak of a technical form of writing and it, uh, with today's media. A technical form of writing, and it's a writing um, where translation is involved in a sense that is different from saying I translate the German text into an English language. No? And then usually we, 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 we say, okay, there is uh, some space of, of liberty in, 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 in making translations, but no, when we, uh, many, of, of, uh, or, uh, or many of, of people who speak the same language read the same text, they are translating it, of course. No, that's why there, there are different readings. So there is a notion of a technical writing that would involve a translation like this. And it would be, there would be a positivity of the translation in the transcription in which it manifests. And this, again, <laughs> is a beautiful idea because it gives a new place to mechanics. So mechanics, and this is similarly, I mean, it's related, obviously, but it's similarly strange for our customs today to say that mechanics actually has something to do with resourcefulness. So yes, it, is, it has to do with tools, it has to do with, uh, with, with craft or skill, but the term, the Greek term, literally meant full of resources, inventive and ingenious. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the line why I'm pointing this out is that there is something very interesting about thinking through a new materialist perspective about a certain objectivity of intellect that manifests in all the devices, also in the things, also in the goods with which we work, that they are all, they are all intellectual agents. Yeah? So there is, <laughs> there is a kind of an artificial, um, artificial intelligence always at work in how we build out norms of dealing with things, of behaving with things. And what art then does, this is again Alberti, yeah? he says, what is it, what is painting all about 
if not the desiring holding on to the surfaces which are the sources of art. <laughs> so by holding on to the surfaces, we can make copies of the source of art and through making copies of the source of art, the source of art is kept springing. Yeah. So, so this is the idea. It's not quite a perpetuum mobile because it's not an entirely automatic thing that could be set in motion and then it goes on. No, it requires pacts. It requires faith. It requires um, it requires uh, something in addition to the mechanical reason. Just like the mechanical reasoning, which is resourceful, no, is not yet creating inventions. <laughs> So there is a, a, a shift in perspective that makes room for a notion of the subject in new materialism, which I think will be very important in the in the future years to work out. So we need to know to, to, to gain notions of, of a subjecthood precisely in order to um, to be able to deal with this uh, sense of the of the vanitas, yeah, with this uh, existential. Um, nichtigkeit, which, uh, yeah, how can we relate to that? Now, how can we relate to that? <laughs> With this, I would now look um, as a, a closing of my of my clip um, to the text which we prepared for today. So, uh, introduction to, to new materialist genealogies, new materialisms. Novel mentalities and quantum literacy. I want to jump um, a bit ahead, so to make this interest in this objective artificial intelligence, to make this transparent. But we began to call a quantum literacy. We wrote here. This is a couple of years back, maybe three years or so. We said we would understand by quantum literacy a kind of disparate, distributive and population-based cognitive faculty that is capable of expressing and addressing conditions and hence grounds and reasons to support all sorts of processes in terms of quantum thinking. While quantum thinking can maintain control of processes, even if without quite understanding how, except that we know it is by mathematics, it remains entirely clear that the manners of control are just manners of dealing that could and can be otherwise different, refined, more crude or more differentiated, generalized, etc. Instead of calling thinking either lucid or blind, we can begin to qualify different lights that apply to thinking. Thinking is not either correct or false, true or corrupt. White light is the sum total of any color at all, independent of the famous argument about different cultures and different languages having different amounts and even different kinds of colors they distinguish. The point, hence, is just that no insight can ever give an exhaustive account of what can, in principle, be cited within the probabilistic possibility spectra that provide reason and support within quantum thinking. Yeah. And I would like to go one step further and um, come back to why this interest in a pact, why this interest in a world, in a cosmos, so not just in the abstractions, not just the points and the physics that a point evidently embodies, but also the categorical thinking of a point, yeah? So the, uh, the metaphysical dimension. And one of the interests in coming up with this notion of a quantum physics um, has been inspired by an approach to literacy studies, here specifically by Eric Havelock, he was one of the teachers of McLuhan, of uh, Marshall McLuhan from the Canadian school. And he began to think a bit, yeah, in an interesting way about what he called a cultural book. His question was, how was it that with Greek philosophy, this whole vocabulary, which we today call metaphysical, so involving categories, involving uh, the universal, involving um, uh, space, involving uh, uh, movement as terms. No? So movement, this is tremendously abstract. To see that things move is not the same, like to speak in a general sense of movement. How is it that such 
leaps in generalization, I would say leaps in abstraction, which render us generalizations. How is it that they happen? And how is it that language can invent words that can capture them? This was his question. He said, so the big wonder in, in metaphysics, in, in, in philosophy, is not so much which one of the paradigms was right, which one of the principles of the schools are more convincing than others, but his question is, how did such a vocabulary of abstract terms evolve? And he makes an argument which, which, uh, which, which uh, works with a very, uh, it's a very strong observation, no? that literature before metaphysics was usually, as what that means also, uh, literature which was primarily uh, oral in its in its uh, circulation would work a lot with formulas with recipes of how to so the the, the odyssey is like uh, it, this is like an encyclopedia of all the techniques that were known at the time so it was a, an education program literature to a large degree as well and um, Havelock now argues that this new cultural book or a new and novel vocabulary of abstract terms resulted from looking at, um, at these formulas, at, this, at, the way, at, the, at the metrics, so from measuring uh, the, the ways how thought, things were talked about before. He writes, the formulaic style characteristic of oral composition represented not merely certain verbal and metrical habits, but also a cast of thought or a mental condition. The pre-Socratics themselves were essentially oral thinkers, prophets of the concrete, linked by long habits to the past and to forms of expression which were also forms of experience. But they were trying to devise a vocabulary and syntax for a new future when thought should be expressed in categories organized in a syntax suitably, suitable to abstract statement. This was their fundamental task and it absorbed most of their energies. So far from inventing systems in the, in the later philosophical manner, they were devoted to the primary task of inventing a language which would make future systems possible. Such, in a simplified outline, was the new picture which began to emerge. So inventing a language which would make future systems possible. This is, for my approach to new materialism, um, one of the most important formulations. No? So, to invent the language. And now, what does this mean? Because we have all the words. Yeah? So, the words are there, but they don't talk to us. <laughs> we don't have vernaculars that would make all the technical specialist jargons, which are the only words that can be precise with the objects with which we live. If I take again this mobile phone, what can I say about it? No, there would, I'm sure there would be 500 words describing it precisely. It would be a short description and I would not be able to make any sense of it at all. This is astonishing. <laughs> yeah, this is astonishing. So we are very, not only illiterate, but also ineloquent. We can't talk about the things with which we live. So if every point that makes up a thing contains all that has ever happened, like Karam Barad is saying, well, how can we start to talk again about what it embodies? Yeah? How can we start to address the contractualities? This was a little bit also a background to my recent book, which is on Michel Serre. Here I show you an old cover, which in the end was, um, it, uh, it didn't end up to to be the cover. My subtitle was Ultimate Capital, Cornucopia of Mathematics and the Price of Information. And the way that this concept makes sense <laughs> has to do with the stories that I try to talk about in this lecture. I look very much forward to discussing with you and to hearing your thoughts on our article and on new materialism, of course. Thanks for listening.